this beautiful Sunday morning. It's good to see all of you this morning. As you know, we at First Baptist Church are here to gather worshipers and grow disciples, to serve others, and to go into all the world and, and share Jesus. Um, so we're excited that God has gather, gathered us this morning. And let me ask you a question. How many of y'all like breakfast? Bacon, sausage, ham, eggs, pancakes, biscuits, gravy, all that kind of stuff. So we're going to have a church-wide breakfast on April the 6th, the first Saturday in, in April. It's usually our men's breakfast, but we're going to have a church-wide. The guys are going to uh, prepare the breakfast for us. Uh, the one thing we need you guys to do is sign up uh, so we know how many to prepare for. So we did pass something around in Bible study, but also in the table, uh, in the foyer, there's an opportunity to sign up. And so great time of fellowship. Uh, maybe you'll see people you don't know because they go to the early service, you come to the late service, uh, you're not in a Bible study class. And so we're just looking forward to that as well. And also we'll be moving, uh, as we move into the week and, and come together, we'll be gathering on Friday evening for a good Friday service. That'll take place at seven o'clock. Um, just pray about who you might invite to that um, as well. And we are excited to be able to, and we'll talk a little bit more about this at the end of the service, but excited to be able to invite people to come hear the gospel uh, about the resurrected Lord. After the Good Friday service at eight o'clock, we'll begin a 24 hour time of prayer. And we've had people sign up for every single slot. We have almost hundred people signed up to pray over a 24-hour period of time. So we'll, we'll send you a reminder this week. Uh, we'll come and meet on um, P1. That'll be the beginning time. We'll have the lock, doors locked through the night. And so uh, make sure that you show up for the next person. Otherwise, the person after you will be locked out. But we'll have directions there in the room, uh, prayer guide as well. And just looking forward to just coming before the Lord in that period of time, starting Good Friday evening um, through Saturday evening at 8 o'clock. So um, keep keep that in prayer as well for those folks that gather. Uh, always keep in mind the fact that we've got a lot of information that we share on social media with Facebook and Instagram and on our website. And so um, it's a good opportunity just to say, hey, um, check out what's going on at First Baptist Church and share that with your friends as well. Did you guys come to worship this morning? I'll praise the Lord. Let's stand and do that together. Well, good morning, church, as we stand and worship the Lord. Uh, as you can see, we, we get to celebrate, we get to be a part of uh, Lord's Supper this morning. And, and it's a special time, but it's a time where we get to, if you haven't, we get to get right with God. And as we worship the Lord, we get to give Him praise with a clean heart. And that's really special. So let's worship the Lord together and let's give Him praise for what He's done. We 
receive what it's yours. Jesus, receive what it's yours. Worthy are you, God. Worthy is your name. Worthy of our praise, we worship you. This morning, let's give him praise. the 
Son, I believe in the Holy Spirit, our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection, that we will rise again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. to Lord in prayer. God, thank you for loving us, just for being so kind, so merciful always to us. God, as we prepare our hearts to remember what you did for us, as we prepare for Lord's Supper, God, you've been so good. God, this whole week is a week that we remember that moment at the cross. It changed history, but God, it changed our lives. You rose again, and we celebrate that every day. And God, as we get this time of special communion, God, we want you to be glorified in every single thing we do. God, you're at work here at FBC Bloomfield, and as we prepare our hearts, God, lead us, clean us. We want to be more like you. Thank you for loving us. We love and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. See you. 
his wounds, his hands, his feet, my Savior on that cursed tree. His body bound and drenched in tears, they laid him down in Joseph's tomb, the entrance here, my heavy soul, Messiah still. with the body of Christ King who pre prepare your hearts to be a part of the Lord's Supper. It's a special time where we remember what Christ has done for us. If you're saved, let me invite you to praise the Lord because he's been so good. Let's praise his name together. Let's sing it out one more. Here you go, church. Sing it out. Let's pray, church. God, we thank you so much 
to be able to be here to praise your name in your name alone. Lord, never doing any of this for ourselves, never being here for our own sake. Lord, the right heart motivation to be here for you, to praise and to worship you because you alone are worthy. And God, we thank you for that. Lord, I'm so grateful for songs that proclaim who you are, that reiterate what your word says. Lord, help us to stand firm on your word day in and day out as individuals, but Lord, also as a corporate body of Christ, as we gather together to worship you each week and as we serve together through uh, the different activities and the events that you've given us to do to reach the community with the gospel. Lord, it's always our desire to make sure that we are making you known as we grow to know you more and more every day. God, thank you for this time that we've been able to take up these tithes and these offerings. Lord, never it being about the penny that's collected, but Lord, it is about worshiping you and giving back to you a portion of what you've entrusted to us so that we can continue to do your work, the mission you've given us this side of heaven. And so God, we give these tithes, these offerings to you as an act of worship, solely dedicated to making you known through the mission of this church. God, as we continue to worship through sitting under the preaching of your word, I pray that you would be with Pastor Ryan as he delivers the message this morning out of Luke. God, that you would open our ears to hear, our hearts to receive what you have for us this morning. Lord, that you would be honored and glorified with our reaction to your word this morning, that we would take it, that we would internalize it, Lord, that we would live it out. God, we love you and we thank you. All in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Over the last couple of weeks, we have given um, some different calls to the church. If you remember two weeks ago, I had called the church to, to pray for conviction of sin and repentance. And um, pray that you are still doing that. That was not a one and done deal, but rather something we're supposed to do every day as we present ourselves as living sacrifices to God, asking him to show us the things in our lives that do not please him. And I said to, we need to start praying for ourselves first, and then praying for our loved ones and our friends, and then praying for our city, praying for our county, our state, our nation, our world, because folks, everybody needs Jesus. And it only starts with conviction of sin, so I pray that you are continuing to do that. But last week, Pastor Craig extended a call for you to hold the rope, and he was asking you to pray for a specific friend, someone just like the men who lowered down the paraplegic to be able to meet Jesus, to be that go-between, that person who brings that one person to Jesus, and I pray again, that the person's name that you wrote down, that you are being that go-between, you're interceding for them on behalf of Jesus, bringing them to the foot of the cross. And this week, our call is a simple one. It is a call to remember. And if you'll remember, two weeks ago, we said we were gonna look at the, the life of Jesus in his last week because if there was a person who knew they only had one week to live, what they did in that week would tell us a lot about what that person values, what that person treasures, what was important in that person's life. But in today's text, we are getting down not just to the last few days of Jesus' life, we are down to the last few days hours. And there is one thing that Jesus has on his mind before he heads to the cross. And he wants to have one more Passover meal with his disciples. But this is not going to be just any Passover meal. Now this was the meal in which he reveals the new covenant. The covenant in which if we have trusted Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we have partaken of that covenant. So if you've got your Bibles, turn with me to the book of Luke. We're gonna be in the 22nd chapter. We're gonna start in verse seven. We see this is the account of the Last Supper, the Lord's Supper. It is in all four of the Gospels, but there's a very specific reason I chose Luke, and I'll make that evident here in just a moment. Again, we're gonna be in Luke 
22, starting in chapter 7. And the first thing I want you to notice is this. I want you to remember that Jesus had all of this planned. Let's start there in verse 7. Now the festival of unleavened bread arrived when the Passover lamb was sacrificed. Jesus sent Peter and John ahead and said, go and prepare the Passover meal so we can eat it together. Where do you want us to prepare it, they asked him. He replied, as soon as you enter Jerusalem, a man carrying a pitcher of water will meet you. Follow him, and at the house he enters, say to the owner, the teacher asks, where is the guest room where I can eat the Passover meal with my disciples? He will take you upstairs to a large room that is already set up. That is where you should prepare our meal. They went off to the city and found everything just as Jesus had said, and they prepared the Passover meal there. Foreshadowing is a very powerful literary device. It is something that uh, writers use in order to, to give us an idea that sort of overshadows everything else in a specific story, a specific account. You've seen it all throughout literature and all throughout history. If you think back to Romeo and Juliet, maybe you read that back when you were in high school. You'll notice that the very first part of that play foreshadows the events that happen at the very end of that play. We see it in movies as well. One of my favorite movies of all times, because it was the first date me and my wife went on, was Jurassic Park. In the movie Jurassic Park, if you'll remember, there's an event, I'm not trying to give any spoilers, but there's an event that happens in the helicopter as they're flying into the park itself that sort of gives you an idea of what is about to happen in the chaos that's coming back. Or maybe even you remember from one of my favorite books of all times from J.R.R. Tolkien, you'll remember the Lord of the Rings trilogy. And if you understand that that is an allegory for the Christian life, it will be no surprise to you at the moment when Gandalf the Grey sacrifices his life to save his friends in front of the mighty Balrog that very soon after Gandalf the White returns. These are all examples of foreshadowing and Luke was using that here in this text as well as he opens up this part of the script, passage of scripture saying, now the festival of unleavened bread arrived when the Passover lamb is sacrificed. This had two meanings, because you see there was a literal meaning there. In order to observe the Passover meal, one would have to take a lamb, take it to the temple, it would be sacrificed there in the proper manner, and then they would take it to their homes, or take it to the room in which they had prepared, and they would prepare the meal there. It's exactly what Jesus was talking about when he told John and Peter to go and to prepare the meal. It had to be eaten within the walls of Jerusalem. That was the correct thing to do in order to observe it the way the Bible lays out in the Old Testament. But metaphorically speaking, this was the time that the Lamb of God would be sacrificed. But not in the same way as the Lamb of Passover, because the Lamb of Passover did it against its will, but rather Jesus was the Lamb who was slain before the foundations of the world, and he laid down his life. It was not taken from him. Jesus was in control of that whole thing. But you might ask, wait a second, Pastor Ryan, why are we supposed to remember that Jesus had everything planned? We make plans ourselves, right? Absolutely, that is 100% correct. As a matter of fact, Jesus himself said, we need to plan. He said, what person goes out to build a tower without counting the cost first? We have talked about that last fall when we were talking about being a good steward of what God has given us. We need to plan for our time, our resources, all of those kind of things. But there is something different between the plans of man and the plans of Jesus, you see, when I was knee-high to a grasshopper, I had my whole life planned out. My plan was to be a garbage man. My plan failed. I grew up just a little bit, went to school, and my plan was to be a forensic pathologist. My plan failed. 
I got a little bit older, we got married, we had kids. My plan was to be a banker for the rest of my life. My plan failed. Even as early as this last week, I thought about taking some time off. My family was on spring break, was gonna go on a really nice vacation. God had other plans for me, had my wisdom teeth removed instead. My plans failed. But the difference is, God's plans never fail. You see, Jesus had a plan that was gonna be carried out exactly the way he wanted it to until the time came when he was ready to lay down his life. For you see, this cloak and dagger language that is used in the verses that we read was not just to confuse people, but it had a purpose. For you see, Jesus knew of a conversation that was had that is recorded in the very first part of chapter 22. For you see, if you remember back when Jesus came into town, there was a big fanfare around him. It's Palm Sunday. It's actually Palm Sunday today, the day we recognize and celebrate that. We talked about that two weeks ago. And there was a bunch of fanfare that Jesus was coming into Jerusalem for the Passover meal. There's a lot of celebration. But when Jesus came in, he was upsetting the status quo of the religious people. He was rubbing those religious people the wrong way, and they said, there's only one way we can stop it. We gotta kill him. But they saw what happened on Palm Sunday and did not wanna cause a fuss. So they said, we've gotta do something about this. We've gotta capture him when nobody's around. And that's when Satan entered Judas and Judas came and said, hey, I'll be glad to turn him over. And it's all summed up in that verse six there. Let me read it to you. It says, so he, talking about Judas, agreed and began looking for an opportunity to betray Jesus so they could arrest him when the crowds weren't around. A perfect time to do this would have been when they were observing the Passover meal. But Jesus had a plan for that Passover meal. Jesus still had to equip his disciples with a little more knowledge before he would head to the cross. He had to give them an ordinance of the Lord's Supper that they would carry to the church on the day of Pentecost that we're still observing today and will observe this morning. Jesus' plan was not done, so that's why he told them in such hush-hush terms, hey, you're gonna go into town. You're gonna see a man carrying a water jug. That was very, very odd. Mostly the women carried the water at that time. When you see that man, you're gonna follow him. When he goes into a house, go and ask the owner of the house. You say these exact words, he'll let you in. I've already set up everything. This is all in my plan. But why does this matter to us? The truth is God has a plan for all of our lives. His plan for our lives involves things that we can't do in our own power, but we can do it in his power. He calls us to forgive people that are unforgivable. He calls us to love people who are unlovable. He calls us to extend grace and mercy into situations that no one else in their right mind were. But remember what Jesus said. Look, my ways are not your ways. And my thoughts are not your thoughts. God's ways are much better than ours. So in those moments, Satan is gonna do everything he possibly can to slow us down and discourage us. He's gonna throw stumbling blocks in our way. He's gonna throw temptations that will pull us off course. And I wanna let you know, Jesus' plans will never fail. And that includes the plan he has for your life. So you keep focused on him, you follow through in obedience and understand that God's ways will come true. Might not be in our timing, might not be the way we want it to come out, but God's will will be done. He will be glorified, it'll be for our good. We can count on that because he never fails. There's another part of this that I absolutely love as well. Because God's plans never fail, and he has all of this planned out, matter of fact, remember, before he even created anything, Jesus is called a lamb that was slain before the foundations of the world. All of this falls into Jesus' plan, and we even see, if you would have joined us on Wednesday nights, Satan is trying to do everything he possibly can all throughout history to thwart God's plan, and guess what? Spoiler alert, Jesus wins. 
He's already won. He was won before it started, folks. And that is the thing we can trust in and focus on and never have to worry about it. But here's the thing. When God calls you to something, he already knows your failures. When he calls you to something, he knows your shortcomings. He knows when you're gonna stumble and he called you to it anyway because he knows you're not doing it in your power, you're doing it in his. And I tell you what, as a pastor, that is so comforting because I am the biggest mess up that has ever existed on this planet, but God has called me to something and I'm gonna have to trust in him more and more and more every day if I'm gonna be found faithful. Same thing goes for your life, folks. We need to understand Jesus had all of this planned out. Second thing I want you to notice this morning is I want you to remember what Jesus' body was given for. Let's start there in verse 14. When the time came, Jesus and the apostles sat down together at the table. Jesus said, I have been very eager to eat this Passover meal with you before my suffering begins. For I tell you now that I will not eat this meal again until its meaning is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took the cup of wine and he gave thanks to God for it and he said, take this and share it among yourselves. For I will not drink wine again until the kingdom of God has come. He took some bread, he gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it into pieces and gave it to the disciples saying, this is my body which is given to you. Do this in remembrance of me. Jesus said this was the last time that he would experience a meal like this on this side of eternity. He knew he was going to the cross. He knew his time was very, very short. And then after he comes back, spoiler alert again, next Sunday, guys, he comes back. He he's comes back. He's alive. He reigns forevermore. He ascended up to heaven. He never had another chance to share this meal. But again, if you were with us on Wednesday night, we were studying Revelation we saw where this is fulfilled at. It's the marriage supper of the Lamb. And I get really excited about this because when I read in Scripture that the church has been reunited with his Savior forever and ever and ever, I know I'm there. I know that I see myself in Scripture, not because of what I've done, but because of what Jesus did for me, and I can't help but get excited. And folks, if you have trusted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you're there too. And this is where the fulfillment of this Scripture is when Jesus says, look, I'm not gonna be able to do this again until we're all together again, and it's coming soon, folks. Jesus is gonna return. It may not be today, it may not be tomorrow, but Jesus promised it, it's gonna happen. He's gonna return for his church one day. But Jesus is laying this out and he's having the, the Passover meal served and the Passover meal was, was done in the exact same way almost every time it was experienced. They would lay out all the different pieces of it. You would have the bread and the, and the wine and the lamb that was cooked and you would partake in that. And usually after the meal was done, there would be someone, usually a child, that would be picked and they would speak up and say, Why is this day different than any day? And at that point here at this Last Supper, the one who was hosting the meal would stand up and would tell him why it was different. He would recount the old covenant. He would talk about when God freed the children of Israel from slavery in Egypt. He would talk about the blood that was smeared on the doorpost during the Passover. They would talk about how good God was. But Jesus added something a little different to that at this point. He starts laying out the new covenant. The old covenant was for Israel. The new covenant was for everyone. And he starts off by handing bread out to those disciples that were around him. By the way, this includes Judas. And he goes and he tells them, this is my life. This is my body, which was given for you. Why does that matter? Why is this something we need to remember? Well, 1 Peter 2, 24 tells us that. He personally carried our sins in his body on the cross 
so that we can be dead to sin and live for what is right. By his wounds, you are healed. We all are sinners. We all sin a lot. If the world was fair, which we like to complain about an awful lot, we would have to pay the penalty for those sins. Scripture tells us the wages of sin is death. But praise God, life is unfair. Because life is unfair, the perfect spotless lamb who was Jesus Christ took upon himself all of our sins. And in that moment, in a moment of grief and suffering that I don't think we'll ever understand the depths of, when he was on the cross and our sins were piled upon him, Jesus himself cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? It was in that moment that he bore all of our sins, which are many, so that we would never have to bear the wrath of God ourselves. Folks, when Jesus tells us to remember during the Lord's Supper, he's telling us, why don't you remember what I did for you, that my body, the wrath of God was poured out upon, not because you deserved it, but because I love you. I have given you the opportunity to be forgiven and it came down to what God poured out upon me on that cross. It is a amazing, it is wonderful. It's something I don't really understand 100%, but I try more and more every day. But every time I do, it gives me goosebumps and makes me wanna shout. Because folks, we do not deserve the forgiveness of God. We deserve the wrath of God. But while we were still his enemies, Christ died for us. He bore the brunt of our sin on that cross. And Jesus tells us, remember, remember. The last thing I want you to notice is this, that we must remember what Jesus' blood did for us. Let's just read here in verse 20. After supper, he took another cup of wine and said, this wine is the new covenant between God and his people. An agreement confirmed with my blood, which is poured out as a sacrifice for you. The old covenant required a lot of sacrifices. If you sinned, if you were unclean ceremonially, you would have to go to the temple and make an animal sacrifice. Depending on your sins, depending on what has done, there were different sacrifices you had to make. But there was one thing that remains true. There was never a sacrifice that could be the ultimate sacrifice for all sins and everyone's sins. As a matter of fact, it tells us in the book of Hebrews, it says it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. So this inadequate sacrificial system was repeated over and over, day in and day out, year after year after year, and they kept having to do it over and over. And that old covenant was not sufficient for what we needed as sinful sinful human beings. We are told without the shedding of blood there is no forgiveness of sin and that's why Jesus came. In Hebrews 8, 7 it says that if the first covenant, if it had been perfect, then Jesus would not need to have come to be a guarantor of the perfect covenant. If you see, when Jesus came and was presenting this new covenant, we heard about this new covenant in the Old Testament. This is the first time in the New Testament we have heard about it. And Jesus is speaking to them saying, look, the Old Testament, it took a lot of different sacrifices, but there is only one required under the new covenant, and that is the perfect sacrifice. It's gonna be me. And when I shed my blood for you, Ephesians 1, 7 tells us a couple of things that happen. It says when his blood is shed for us and we make him the Lord of our lives, we are miraculously saved. His blood cleanses us 
from all of our sin. Our sin, which is dark and dirty and nasty, when it's washed in the blood of Jesus, it is white as snow, just like we see in the book of Revelation played out with the saints who stand before the throne. Folks, that has nothing to do with us. That's all Jesus. It is grace, his mercy, his love that is poured out upon us unconditionally. We stand before him perfect, but it also tells us that with the blood of Jesus, we are set free from the slavery of sin. I talk to people a lot during the week that are in brokenness and they're suffering, and most of them don't realize it. So sometimes when I'm trying to share the gospel, I'll ask them, how does it feel to be a slave? And they'll be, what are you talking about? I'm not a slave, I'm an American, I'm free. I said, you're a fool. There is a sin in your life that is leading you everywhere it wants you to go, not the other way around. Oh, no, I don't have any sin that does that in my life. Really, I see an addiction right here in your life. Stop it. I can't. Like I said, you're a slave to sin. You're not a free man. But you know what the Bible says? The Bible says when the sun sets you free, you are free indeed. And that only comes through the blood of Jesus Christ. It's only through the blood of Jesus Christ that we are forgiven, we are free, we are made brand new, we have a new life in Christ. And Jesus says, do this in remembrance of me. You remember where you were and remember what I did for you. As far as the east is from the west, so I have cast my, your sins from you. Folks, there's no greater distance than the east from the west. It's immeasurable. Satan loves to bring up our past follies and sins, but one day we're gonna have to stand before the king of kings and the judge of judges, and you know what he's gonna see? He's only gonna see the blood of Jesus on our account that has freed us from all of our sins. That's what Jesus is talking about here. In just a little bit, Jesus was finished. He was done with his job, and it tells us that he went to the Mount of Olives as was usual. You know why? Because that's exactly where Judas would have known he would be. Jesus was now ready to lay down his life. He was finished equipping his disciples. His plan was done, and now it was time to lay down his life as a lamb who was sacrificed and died before the sins of the world. And this morning, we get to celebrate that as an act of worship. We're gonna partake in the Lord's Supper. And there's a wonderful thing that we see in the book of 1 Corinthians that Paul tells us. He sort of gives us the order how we're supposed to observe this and he tells us that we're supposed to do this until Christ comes. As we partake in the Lord's Supper, we're proclaiming his coming until it happens. And when that happens, we're all gonna get to sit down at the marriage supper of the Lamb. And folks, I know God is holy. He is three times holy. There is no greater word to describe him but I get a little excited to know that one day I'm gonna be able to be there at that marriage supper, worshiping my Savior for all of eternity, that there'll be no more brokenness, there'll be no more sickness, there'll be no more tears, all of that is gone away because I'm in the presence of God Almighty. The one who came, gave his body, and shed his blood so that under the new covenant, I could be made right with God once and for all. And that's what we're gonna celebrate now. So I'm gonna ask our deacons to come, the musicians are gonna come. As we observe the Lord's Supper, this is a, a very sacred time. It's something we don't need to take lightly. So I ask you, if you are here today and you've never trusted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, please do not partake in the Lord's Supper. No one's gonna say anything to you. Nobody's gonna make fun of you. Nobody's gonna think any worse of you or better of you. 
because we were all there once. We were all sinners. There is nobody that's born a Christian. And if you think you were, you're lost. This is only for people who've trusted Jesus as their Lord and Savior. A time for us to remember what Jesus did for us. But before we partake, Paul tells us something in his letter to the church in Corinthians. He says, anyone who eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord unworthily is guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of our Lord. That is why you should examine yourselves before eating the bread and drinking the cup. For if you eat the bread or drink the cup without honoring the body of Christ, you are eating and drinking God's judgment upon yourself. So I'm gonna ask you for a moment to pray. Pray for the convictions of your sin. Pray that God will point out the things in your life that are not pleasing to him. That you can acknowledge, you can repent and turn your back on. He will forgive you, he will cleanse you from all unrighteousness. Let's take a moment and ask God to please reveal that to us now. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, as we get ready to worship you by observing the Lord's Supper, when the ordinances you commanded your church to carry out until the day you return, and we get to feast with you in person. Lord, I pray right now, if there is anything that is holding us back from taking this Lord's Supper in a worthy manner, that you would point it out in our lives that you would show it to us. And Lord, we know that you are faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. Forgive us of those sins. But we just gotta acknowledge them and bring them before you. Lord, if there is anything that is in the way of us worshiping you now and letting this worship be acceptable to you, would you point it out to us? God, I'm so excited to be able to partake in this, especially after being reminded of all that you did for us on the cross. Would you be glorified in this place? We ask this in the name that's above every name, Jesus Christ. Amen.
for I pass on to you what I receive from the Lord himself. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread. He gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and said, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this to remember me. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you so much for the body of Jesus Christ. Symbolically, as we partake in the Lord's Supper, Lord, we are reminded that he took our sins on the cross. He did not deserve it. He was not guilty, but he was treated as such for our sake. I will never get over that. Thank you so much, Lord. As we continue, just pray you'll be blessed by the worship that we bring to you. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. took the cup of wine after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this to remember me as often as you drink it. For every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you're announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we are so thankful for the blood of Jesus Christ. 
Father, without it, we would not be forgiven. Without it, we would not be free. Without it, we would have no hope for the future. But through the blood of Jesus, we have everything. Thank you, Lord, for so lavishly pouring out your grace and your mercy and your love upon us as was shown on the cross. So, Father, as we move into another time of worship, Father, again, I pray it's not just us singing, but we are bringing worship that is pleasing to your ears. I ask this in the name that's above every name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Would you please stand to your feet? Coming to a time, I said, of an invitation. We're going to be worshiping with a song about the blood. And church, I ask you to worship with all your heart. It's so encouraging to see from God's word to be reminded of what the blood did for us. It is so encouraging to be able to partake in the Lord's Supper, to be reminded about the body that was crushed, about the blood that was poured out for us, that took our sins, and just to give back a little bit of what he has given to us. But maybe you're here today and you weren't able to partake in the Lord's Supper because you have never trusted Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Folks, I'm gonna ask you, why not today? Folks, you're a sinner, and the Bible says the wages of sin is death. And no matter how good you are, no matter how good your intentions, you will never work your way into heaven. But praise God, through Jesus Christ, you can know that you know that you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that today, if you took your last breath this side of eternity, you'll be in the Lord's presence tomorrow. We have pastors down front who would love to share that good news with you. It's something we call the gospel. Would you please respond this morning? Oh, 